Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Florida International University's Cuban Research Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Oliva M. Espin to discuss My Native Land is Memory, Stories of a Cuban Childhood. To moderate tonight's conversation and to give the author a proper introduction, we're joined by Dr. Jorge Duani. Dr. Duani is director of the Cuban Research Institute and professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami. He has published extensively on Caribbean migration, ethnicity, race, nationalism, and transnationalism. He's the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of 22 books, including Picturing Cuba, Art, Culture, and Identity on the Island and in the Diaspora, and Puerto Rico, What Everyone Needs to Know. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. So put in your questions as you listen, and you can order your copy of My Native Land is Memory from Books and Books by calling 305-442-4408. You'll be calling our Coral Gable store. You can place your order for pickup or we will gladly ship it to you. We appreciate every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Duani to the virtual stage. Thank Hello. you, Christina. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to tonight's book presentation. Uh, as usual, we're very happy to co-sponsor the event with Books and Books, uh, and we're proud to continue to present some of the best work by leading scholars and writers on the Cuban and Cuban-American experience. I'd also like to acknowledge the support Dr. Susanna Rose, Associate Provost of the uh, Office to Advance Women, Equity, and Diversity at Florida International University, who first suggested that we organize today's event. Let me remind you again that you can submit questions during and after the office talk uh, by clicking on the button uh, uh, at the bottom of, the, of your screen, and I'll compile uh, these questions uh, and post them to the author after her presentation. Uh, and again, in addition to that button, remember that if you want to purchase the, the book, you can do so by calling Books and Books uh, at the number uh, at the bottom of the screen. I'm pleased to introduce our guest author, Dr. Oliva Spin, who is a prolific author uh, who has contributed significantly to feminist psychology and other fields of study. She was born in Santiago de Cuba. And in 1961, she left the island and began her life as an immigrant in various places ranging from Spain, Panama, Costa Rica, Belgium, Canada, and eventually the United States. Her memoirs, which are, we're going to be talking about today, tell us about growing up in pre-revolutionary Cuba and living most of her life away from her country of birth. Dr. Espin is the first Latina professor emer emerita of women's studies at San Diego State University, where she has taught, where she taught for uh, many years, she received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Costa Rica and her doctor of degree in counseling from the University of Florida. Upon receiving her doctoral degree, she worked as a psychotherapist, interim assistant professor at McGill University in Canada, and as an associate clinical professor at Boston University before working uh, at a National Institute of Mental Health Fellowship at Harvard University. Dr. Espin is well known for her pioneering intellectual contribution to feminist therapy, immigration, and women's studies, and her advocacy on behalf of refugee women to help them gain access to mental health services. Her interdisciplinary scholarly work brings together perspectives from psychology, sociology, politics, and religion to further understand issues and barriers related to gender, sexuality, language, and race. She is a vanguard, vanguard of transnational psychology, a field that applies transnationalist feminist lenses to the field of psychology to study, understand, and address the impact of colonization, imperialism, and globalization. 
She has received numerous honors and awards from the American Psychological Association, the Fulbright Foundation, the Association for Women in Psychology, the National Latino and Latina Psychological Association, and the British Psychological Society. She's also the author of numerous, numerous books, including Women, Sainthood and Power, A Feminist Psychology of Cultural Constructions, published in 2020, Gender Journeys, Women, Migration and Feminist Psychology, 2015, and Women Crossing Boundaries, A Psychology of Immigration and Transformations of Sexuality, published in 1991, among many other books. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Oliva Espin. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm glad to see you all. Um, let me uh, try to turn on my presentation, um, which I'm, I'm sort of trying to do my best to do this. So, okay, let's. Oops. So I have to do no, this one. Share. Okay. Okay. There we are. You can see it, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So um, this is going to be a quick overview of my book, my David Landis memory stories of a Cuban childhood. And of course, the book has much more than what I can do in a brief period of time. But um, I hope you um, get a sense of what this is about. And as Jorge says, um, I've been a professor for 45 years and published a number of books. These are the three latest ones. Um, in the memoir, we are going to be um, talking about my child's perspective of what was going on in Cuba and things that have to do with my life. I am not an expert in Cuban politics. So questions about what's going on in Cuba are not what I'm going to answer because I am not an expert in that topic. I simply have a lived experience for a number of years. So um, this is the outline. It's basically the outline of the book, the story in the book. Um, you can see it's a map of Cuba. And this is me when I was eight months old. So the book starts with a prologue in which I talk about leaving Cuba in 1961. My sister and my father had visas to come to the US. My mother and I didn't. And my two little brothers came to the US with the Peter Pan program, which those of you who are Cuban, I know um, took, um, lifted about 14,000 Cuban children uh, from Cuba to the U.S. in the early 1960s. My mother and I did not have visas, so we went to Spain, which is where we could get a visa. And we lived in Madrid for a while in an apartment that had a Picasso original, strange as it might seem. Someone had lent it to us. And then in 1984, 23 years after I had left, I went back to Cuba. And um, then there's, you know, I, I write about the experience of being there at that time and uh, all the memories that this uh, visit opened. So from the prologue, you have here pictures of, this is a picture of my parents right before they left Cuba, my passport with the permit to exit Cuba. And this is my picture in Madrid for the green card for the U.S. Okay. So when we start talking about my Havana childhood, my Havana childhood actually started in Santiago de Cuba. My parents were born in the cathedral, were born, were married. <laughs> were, they were born in Santiago. They were married in the cathedral. This is my mother entering the cathedral. As you can see, she's walking by herself because she didn't want to be given away. And this is a picture from 1937. So. Okay, my father was then in the military. He was a lawyer for the, for the Cuban Navy. And so that's why he's in his military uniform and his colleagues uh, did this thing, which is called La Boveda de Acero or the sort of the, the steel um, 
whatever name it has in English, I never remember it, um, at the end of the wedding. Um, this is me when I was two years old, sitting in this fountain we had in, in the yard, and, you know, there you go. Um, but then, you know, something happened. Batista took over as president for the, the only time he was elected president. Um, and really, he couldn't afford the slightest disloyalty among the military. So my father and anyone who was not 100% um, in support of Batista was fired from the military without any, uh, you know, kind of um, respect or process or anything. And just as a little detail, this is a poster for the election of Batista in 1940. And as you can see, the Cuban communists were very intent on having him elected president, although he later tried to forget that that had to do with his background. Anyway, when my father was hired, um, what he thought was that he wanted to start something and he started a school in this street which is Simón Bolívar officially, but everybody calls it Reina, Calzada de Reina. And um, the school was in this part of the building, in this upper floor. So I grew up in two rooms in the back of that school. Of course, this is not a picture from the time. This is a picture I took when I went back to Cuba after. And these are my sister and I uh, around this time. So we moved to Havana. This is in this um, black dot here. It's where the school was. And um, it was a very noisy street. Obviously, no fountain in the garden. There was no garden. So it was not a pleasant place to live. OK, this is oops, my mother in her early 30s. She was a very beautiful woman. Uh, but. Um, she was overworked, cleaning the school and taking care of children and etc. This is my father with me. And this is my aunt Marina, who was my mother's older sister, who came to Havana to help my mother with the children. Uh, we were four children. And uh, my mother um, was the one who taught me to read. And the first sentence I was able to read is the one that appeared in the cartilla, in the little reading book. Um, that So the first sentence was, mi mama me ama, my mother loves me. OK. Um, I had scoliosis as a child when I was seven or eight years old. And my mother took me to physical therapy and always called at me saying, do you want you to be a hunchback? So she was, she was overworked, as I said, and that made her not be terribly pleasant. This is the school I went to because my father didn't want uh, his children going to the school where he was the director. So we went here. This was in El Vedado, it's Colegio del Apostolado. And obviously, again, this with these signs here show that this picture was taken after. OK, so this is me with my sister, Nettie, um, when um, I was starting first grade, more or less. This is me reciting poetry, which is something I did a lot, and my first communion picture. I, everybody said that was very intelligent, that, oh, what a smart girl, and this and that and the other. And I sort of became a pedantic little girl, thinking that I knew everything. So I was a Marisa Vidilla. Um, and the stress and that continued uh, had some effect on me in such a way that at some point I decided to stop eating. And I had to be commanded to eat by telling me chew and swallow, mastica y traga. Okay. During my childhood in Havana, every Saturday morning, my father took my sister and I to go around all Havana. And this is some of the, this is um, the palace of the um, Spanish governors, uh, mansions, etc. La Plaza de San Francisco. And Sears, Sears had an escalator. And my sister and I loved going up 
and down the escalator because it was it seemed magic to us. So that's why Sears is there. There were other monuments in Havana that we visited. La India, which is a beautiful fountain, the statue of Martí, and the national capital. And of course, the cathedral. Um, Havana Cathedral is in an architectural style that it's um, known as Cuban Baroque. And, and it's, it's a very beautiful style. And, but the highlight was the capital. Going into the Salón de los Pasos Perdidos, the, soul, the hall of the lost footsteps, which is, as you can see, impressive and beautiful. And around here in this uh, rotunda in the center is this statue of La República, the Republic, that is one of the largest, I think it's the second or third largest um, statue inside a building. So on Saturday mornings, we did that. On Saturday afternoons, we went with my mother to visit her aunt. Tia Matilde, which was my grandmother's uh, sister, and this is me, and this is my sister. And in uh, when when we visited Tia Matilde, I read Tarzan, The Adventures of Tarzan, in um, the um, comic uh, in the in the paper, and absolutely adored Tarzan. Um, coming back from Tia Matilde's house one day we heard that the war had ended in Europe. And then there was a um, little sing song in, in Cuba at that time, ping, ping, cayo Berlin, pom, pom, cayo Japón. Ping, ping, Berlin has fallen, pom, pom, Japan has fallen. Okay. At the same time, the president, who was then Ramon Grau, was the one who announced the end of the war after the, in August after the Hiroshima bombs. And I went to first grade a month after that. A few years later, this guy, Chivas, who was a politician, he, he was a senator who spoke every Sunday night on the radio, shot himself in front of the microphones. Um, he was supposedly a very honest politician who was very upset about corruption. So anyway. So it, this was something that was a shock to everyone. Uh, on Sundays, we went to my grandmother's house and we had to go through the University of Havana and through the cemetery. Uh, we changed trolleys, tranvías, um, uh, very close to the cemetery. And the Colón Cemetery in Havana, it's supposed to be the third or fourth in beauty in the world because of the, the sculptures in marble and etc. So on, on those days, we went to my grandmother's house, which we call Abuela Boki, and this is her house. And these are my grandparents. They got married in New York in 1896 because they both were away from Cuba because Cuba was a colony of Spain and they and their families were, were very opposed to the colonial government. So they were struggling with other people for Cuban independence. So that's why they were in New York and they married in New York. Something interesting about this house and Abuela Boki that has to do with my own personal life is that my grandmother, Abuela Boki, died of a massive heart attack in front of my eyes when I was nine years old and we, she and I, were alone in her house. So at nine years old, I had to get out to look for help because I didn't know what was happening to my grandmother. And it's a shock, a trauma that has stayed um, always. Another important person in my life at that time was my uncle, Tio my father's brother, who together with my father did everything they could to show me that I could achieve things. And one of the things he did is that he published this little booklet with poems I had written, and it was published when I was 10 years old. And, you know, to be a published poet at 10 sort of inflates yourself again in ways that may be good because it tells you that you can achieve, but also may inflate yourself a little bit too much. 
and that was there. Okay. Okay. So while in Havana, we were completely enclosed in this building that was concrete and big traffic in the street and etc. Every summer, my sister and I went to spend three months with my mother's family in Santiago, in the home where my mother had lived since she was a child. So this is Santiago in relation to Cuba, and this is that part of Cuba with Santiago here, and Guantanamo, which is a whole city. Guantanamo is not just the military base. The military base is in Caimanera, which is a little island, a uh, little territory around Guantanamo. And just as curiosity, this is Haiti, and this is Lekei, which is the place where the last earthquake in, in Haiti just happened. Okay, in Santiago, in this circle here, is where the family house was, and this is the family house. Um, as you can see, just from looking at the outside, the size is considerably bigger than the place where we lived, and uh, the inside of the house was just uh, magnificent. It was a huge house, beautiful, full of interesting furniture and interesting places. The floors, as you can see, are um, very dramatic. This is uh, the door to my grandfather's bedroom, and this is another piece of the floor in Cuba, for those of you who don't know that. Um, instead of rugs, because it's too hot for rugs, the floors were made of this tile with beautiful designs that make them look like rugs, but of course they weren't. This is the hallway that went from where we were before in front of my grandfather's to the kitchen. And this is the kitchen, which was a coal kitchen. So my grandmother cooked on coal. Okay, This is the yard of that house, the patio which I loved, I fantasized there that I was, whatever it is, I fantasized that I was there, anything I could think of, um, from, from being Robin Hood to being Joan of Arc to being any, anything I could think of. So it was a place that I really loved. And there were lots of flowers. These pictures are from um, a recent trip, but um, at that time, the place was full of flowers. So this is my these are my grandparents. My mother's parents were from Spain. Um, my grandmother came when she was nine years old. My grandfather, when he was 15, he taught himself to read and write and became very wealthy. And um, something that happened was when he was eight years old, 80 years old, he was retired, living in a small farm he had near Santiago. He heard a noise, thought it was an intruder, got his gun, and what happened was that the gun um, shot him, or he shot himself with his gun in his leg, and had to have his leg amputated. And when this happened, everybody saw, thought, oh, this 82-year-old man, of course, it's going to die because he, we had to amputate his leg. Well, he died at 102, 20 years later. So he lived 20 years without one leg, but continued living. And my fond memories are him telling his stories of his life, sitting in that patio we saw before, um, talking about what it had been like to come to Cuba and teach himself to read and write and etc. My grandmother was always grouchy. The only beautiful place in the world for her was Spain. And she was constantly telling stories about the beauty of Spain. And something very interesting is that, of course, she had left when she was nine. The only other time she had seen Spain was when my mother, who's in this picture here, was 15, and they took the whole family to Spain to meet their relatives and probably show off the money they had that the relatives did not have. So she had two very brief experiences of Spain, but she talked about, about Spain all the time. So I sort of conceived the idea that Spain must be absolutely marvelous. So, okay. More about Santiago. This is Parque Céspedes, which is the 
sort of in the center of the city. This is Hotel Casa Granda, which was started in 1914, and it's a beautiful hotel. I went back to Cuba in 2011, which was the 50 years after I had left, and I made a point of staying here, which was completely inconceivable when I was a child, because we personally, my father and my family, did not have any money. So there was no way we could have been there, but okay. So this is again Santiago, this is the city hall, and this is the cathedral where my parents got married. And here are two other pictures of um, the, the square. This house here is the house of Diego Velasquez, and this is the interior of that house. It is probably the oldest house in all of the Americas. It is from 1516, and of course it has been restored. But right now, the house is the Colonial Museum in Santiago. And in the back, in this part here, there was a club called the Lyceum. Um, and I used to go there a lot, coming you know, from the park back there through the street to go there. And in the yard of this Lyceum, was this um, well that I spent hours as a child looking into the well because I found it very intriguing. In the Lyceum also, uh, there were uh, these, you know, medio punto uh, windows that are typical of, um, of Cuba. And in there, I heard Pedro Arrupe, who was the superior of the Jesuits in Hiroshima when the bomb fell and um, eventually became the superior general of the Jesuits and he's now in the process of being canonized. I was maybe 10, 11 years old. He was going around the world talking about the evils of atomic bombs because he had seen it in Hiroshima. And I remember still to this day vividly what he said. And in fact, when I was going to um, write this on the book, I made sure that I look at the speech he was giving about it. And I remember details of that speech. I mean, it was rather an intense experience also. So two other places or another place I liked in Santiago was the Bacardi Museum. The um, founder or one of the founders, not quite the first founder of the Bacardi Rum Company. Uh, created this museum in Santiago. And one of the things he did was he got a mummy from Egypt to the museum. So every summer I had to go see the mummy. And when I went back to Cuba in 2011, I made a point of going to take a picture of the mummy. Okay. Um, this is also a couple of places in Santiago and I better hurry up. Um, this is the El Cobre, where Our Lady of Charity is, and this is El Cayo, where my sister and I loved um, being on a boat. Okay, adolescence. When I became an adolescent, we moved to El Vedado, around here first, and then later around here. The, the two small red dots are where we live there. This is the house where, or exactly like the house, next door to, um, these are sort of typical houses from El Vedado, but this is where we lived. It was a rather dilapidated, not as bad as it is now, but it was not in great shape at that time. And El Vedado is sort of a very nice neighborhood. This is the El Vedado from um, above, from the sky, and this is from across the bay. So this is me when I was about 13 years old, I took that picture for a boyfriend. <laughs> and this is me with my other siblings uh, around that same time. When I was about 13 years old in 1952, Batista took over again. And this time it was completely a coup. It was complete military dictatorship. It was He was not being elected as a legitimate president. So I lived my adolescence basically with Batista in power. These are pictures from my same poems again at school and my high school graduation. And this is a picture of my family that sort of describes what was going on at that time. Uh, right after 
I graduated from high school, I started tutoring children. And in about a year, I was earning more money than my father. So this picture, it's sort of psychologically sort of an encapsulation of what was happening in that we were the breadwinners. And, and I, I had a position that on the one hand made me very proud. On the other hand, it was not particularly good for someone so young because it was actually a burden to support my family at that age. Um, these are a couple of pictures about me uh, from me. This is the last place where we lived. Again, these two pictures were taken by me. This is from the 84 trip and this is from the 2011 trip you can see the deterioration of the building and these are my sister and i um, standing here and we could see the malecon back there you cannot see it but um that's the malecon which is the so sort of the a big promenade uh, on the havana shore okay then we go to 1958 which was probably one of the most important years in my life. As you can see from my picture, I wasn't particularly happy at that time. And I actually belonged to this organization called Rosa Mystica. And um, I, I was not happy, as I said. It was a very hard year. It was the last year of Batista government. Um, there was a lot of violence all over. And um, I, I was not in good shape. So one of the things Batista did was create a tunnel that covered this space uh, in the Havana Bay. It's very narrow at the entrance, like San Francisco, and then it becomes big. This tunnel, you had to drive around, descending around this statue, and then cut across. And there was a popular song about, let's go to the tunnel to kiss. Well, it was a minute ride, though there was no time to kiss, but okay. And then something happened that I would not have expected. I was called for a TV program and I, it, it was a, a quiz show. I was competing, I was 19, competing with adults, with three other adults, four other adults, and I won. Uh, I won $4,000, which at that time was a year's salary in the US. So suddenly having lived practically in poverty all those years and having to work from a very young age, suddenly I had this backload of money. So the first thing I did with it was go to Europe. So this is my passport and I wanted first to go to Spain because my grandmother had told it was it was beautiful, but then I went to other places. And one of the most important, one of the most impressive things I saw was the victory of Samotras in Paris that became sort of a symbol for me. And then the revolution came and uh, we were thinking that Fidel was gonna do wonders and of course he didn't, so, okay. Uh, soon after, in a in few mo months into 1959, uh, my uncle died, Tio, and I started having horrible panic attacks and started going to therapy. And really therapy sort of, I don't know, made me, took away a lot of the burden and a lot of the things that, that were happening for me, traumas, whatever it may have been. And um, eventually I got out of the panic attacks and it's one of the things that made me want to be a psychologist. And this is a play we acted at, um, in, at the Catholic University. And I played this role here. At, this is not me. This is the woman who played in the movie about that, about Dialogues of Carmelites. But um, this is the role I played. Okay. So you already heard that I had left that I had come back. And when I came back in 1984, um, I, when I returned to Cuba, I mean, when I returned to Miami after being in Cuba for the first time, um, there was a full moon. And when I got to Miami, I thought, you know, this is not the same moon I just saw in Cuba. This is a moon from another world. So it, it was a very strange sensation. Then as I told you, I went back in um, 
2011 and it was a very different place not only like the one i had left in 61 but even the one i had visited in the 80s this is the church that was at the end of my street and one of the things that was shocking is that there were a number of santeras coming in and out of churches which was something unheard of before okay um this is another view of cuba at that time el prado with the sculptures uh, one of the many houses in cuba that are absolutely beautiful in architecture but are very deteriorated and this is the iconic moro castle and then finally these are two views of the entrance to havana this is from um a, pa a face page in facebook it's a beautiful picture taken this way the motor is here as you can see this is something i took from the plane when i was leaving so it's sort of a different angle in this case we are looking at the entry this way and in this case we are looking at the entry to the bay this way okay needless to say there is much more to say than what i have said because um you know the book has a number of pages and um and I couldn't do this in this short period of time. I just want to read for you two of the final sentences of the book, and then I turn it to Jorge for questions. Um, one of these sentences I want to read at the very end of the book is, I am who I am because I was born in Cuba and because Cuba is no longer my home. I don't know if I will ever see Cuba again, but in my imagination, I want to stand indefinitely at the spot where the Malecon starts, forever looking at the Havana coastline while I stand by the low wall of the Malecon. I want to look at the Moro Castle on the other side of the water, at the sun or the moon reflected on the water. And I know that one day, my ashes will wash on that shore, carried through the distance by the foamy blue waves. Okay. So let's go to Jorge. And if you want, here is my um, email. If you want to write me directly about anything and do remember to buy the book. Okay. I'm going to now close this and go back to, um, yes, okay, go. Okay. Thank you, Oliva, for uh, summarizing your work for our uh, audience. And again, let me remind uh, whoever is out there uh, seeing this that you can send your questions by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. So I, I wanted to begin the conversation with the author asking a couple of questions as I heard her speak about her work. And because you are a psychologist, I, I wanted to uh, ask you about what do you think is, is uh, the role of memory in, in trying to reconcile the past and the present and especially, uh, and I know that you have worked and, and written about this uh, in the case of migrants and exiles. Well, for people who have migrated from the place of birth, particularly from people who cannot go back to that place regularly, like we cannot, um, the only thing you have to remember, the, to, to even understand who you are, is your memory. Because you're not going to the places, you're not seeing the places, you're not even seeing the same people because you're many times living among people you did not meet until the last 10 years or whatever. So memory is sort of what makes you a person, like what keeps your identity together. And one of the important things for people is to tell their stories because telling your stories, and you know that people may forget what they did 10 minutes ago, but they don't tend to forget what they did when they were 10 years old. So telling stories, it's something that helps people stay together. I mean, stay together yes. within themselves. I don't mean together with others. Yes, maybe, but 
to sort of keep your identity together. Yeah. And how important was uh, returning to Cuba for you? I think you mentioned at least twice, maybe more times. How yeah. important was that in recovering those memories? Very, particularly that first trip in 1984. I left when I was 22 and I came back 23 years later. So at that time, I had lived half of my life in Cuba and half of my life outside of Cuba. And looking at those places, it's sort of, one of the things I did was I went places and I never got lost. I went to where I needed to go and I never got lost. And some people would say, do you want me to take you here? You want? And I said, no, I don't need anybody to take me anywhere. The, the buildings have not moved. And one of the good things is that because there hasn't been any construction in Cuba, the buildings are the same. You know exactly where you are and what what's in the next corner and this kind of so so that it was a sense of cuba exists beyond what i think it is a physical thing it's not just my thoughts so that was a very powerful experience at that time and of course then i remember other things and the, there were some things that happened when i went to my grandmother's house and there's a woman or somebody else living there and i walked into the kitchen where she had died and i looked at that spot and i started crying for no reason in reality i mean i hadn't cried or at all during the trip and suddenly standing there i started crying so something got touched emotionally beyond what the thinking about what happened here so there, there were a number of things that memories evoked. And what I talk about that in the prologue to the book about how, you know, this, this thing about the memories that like boxes opened up in a way, either emotionally or concretely in that first trip. And I, I actually have been back four times. I went back then, then in 1987. I made a point of going in 2011 because I wanted to be there at the 50th anniversary of departure for no particular reason, just because I wanted. And then I went back in 2017 with a group of mental health professionals. And I was sort of the informal, we, we saw the people and did other things, but I was sort of the informal guide of that. So the last trip was in 2017. Can you talk a little bit more about the photographs? And I know that your book has a lot of them. I don't know if all of yes. these photographs are included in the book or not, but how did you choose them? Why did you choose these particular photographs? Um, the the um, publisher of the book asked me for photographs. And, and rather than putting them in a piece of the book, like some books put all photographs in one place, they are along the book. As I'm writing about a subject, the photographs are there. And I basic I have photographs from old family photographs that some of these are, or photographs I took in the trips back, and um, I sent him I don't know how many a hundred maybe, and he chose saying this would go with this this would go with this you know and he chose the ones he thought would be better so some of what I've added here are some of the maps and the views from above the city and that, that's not in the book. But family photographs and the places where we lived and that kind of thing, it's there, are there. So basically the, the, you wrote the text first and then the photographs were added yes. to yes. illustrate the text. Yes, right, right. exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in one of your slides, uh, La Pecera, the fishbowl. And I know that's a very important moment yes. for, for many Cubans who left in the early 1960s. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, it was a glass enclosure where the people who were leaving the country were put in that. So you could see those saying goodbye to you and they could see you, but you could not talk because there was a thick glass. Um, so it felt like you were in a fish bowl. And because you could not talk, you sort of mouth like fish doing <laughs> what you wanted to say. One of the things I talk about is that when my father left, 
my parents put their hands on both sides of the glass, you know, like sort of touching each other through the glass. And there were a number of scenes like that of people, you could see people crying, you could, you would mouth, I love you, I'll see you soon, and you know, all that. So um, when, when I went back in 1984, there was no pesera there anymore. So it was, they, they took that away once people were not allowed to leave the country. So, yeah. Yeah, and so I think also they had, they had built an enclosure. Yeah. They built a new, a new airport, right? So that yes, people don't... Now, now, now the airport is very sexy. It's like yeah. any elegant airport in the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one final question for me, and I, and I see one question here uh, from the audience. Um, I think you, you mentioned this throughout your presentation, but could you say a little more about how these personal experiences as, as a child and as a teenager, uh, a migrant and refugee yourself, how did that shape your own career uh, and your research agenda? Well, concretely, basically my work, both as a therapist and writing and doing research has been about women immigrants and women refugees and how women's sex roles change with which consequences and et cetera through the process of migration. And so it's, it's been what I have focused on for most of my career. These last two books, the one on saints and the memoir are very recent, years after I retired. So yeah during my career that's what i did so and okay, so let me turn yes go ahead no no you know yeah okay let, let's go to somebody yes yes there's there's a couple of questions already here from the audience one of them is from rene costales who wants to know if you had any meaningful conversations with persons of your age in your 1984 and 2011 trips yes um well for one thing I saw my, when I went in the 84, my aunt was still, my last aunt was still alive. My cousin still lives in Cuba and so that. And then um, again in, in 2011, um, I saw some people who were my classmates in 84 who had never left Cuba. And we talked about that experience about what it meant to stay and what it meant to leave um so yes i i took and of course i mean the people who stayed basically agreed with the revolution and that's why they stayed so we tried not to argue about that we just talked about you know remember when we did this or that when we were at school that was mostly the topic of conversation the other question is actually related to this by, from Gene Rosenberg, and he asked uh, whether you visited with people from your childhood in Cuba, and if so, what was that like? Yeah, okay. Another question come in, came in, right? Yeah, the third question is from Miriam Lubet, who wants to know, how are your brothers and sister? They are, well, my, they, they're dead, basically. Um, yeah. You're the last one from the family. Yes, pretty much. I I I have a brother with, who's still alive, but we haven't been in touch for some years. So, um, but my sister and my who was my companion of my whole life, um, you can see her in many photographs with me, and my youngest brother, who actually was twelve years younger than me both died in 2019, a month apart from each other from completely unrelated reasons. So it was, yes. So let me ask you another uh, personal uh, uh, question for me. As I mentioned before, my father's family is also from Santiago. I was born in Havana. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to, uh, to comment on the differences between the two places, especially growing up and traveling back to Santiago in the summers, did you feel at home in both cities? Did you feel Havana was more your neighborhood or? Well, you know, of course I was in Havana 
most of my life. We moved there when I was three years old, and that's where I left from. So, and in fact, when I go back, it's very easy for me not to get lost in Havana. And my cousin, who's from Santiago, who in the last trip came to Havana to spend time with me while I was there, um, I she didn't know where this or that was. And I was the one who said, it's this way or that way, you know? Um, so... In that sense, I know Havana well. Santiago for me is like joy. Everything beautiful and happy and perfect and etc. happens in Santiago. I had to live in Havana because I had to live in Havana. <laughs> you know, it was that. Particularly during those years until I was 13 years old when we moved to El Vedado. Um, that that house it was very constricted the street was very noisy it was it was not a place where i enjoyed myself but in santiago i completely enjoyed myself i mean playing in the park every night going to the lyceum eating my grandmother's food playing in the in the patio i mean it was it was being in heaven so all my association and i feel very proud that i'm from santiago you know I did, in a way, sort of like my grandmother was proud of Spain without having ever really lived there. Well, that's except, you know, I went regularly to Santiago, but still, you know, it it feels it's it's associated with happiness. Yes. And of course, you know, Santiagueros are very proud and think they're better than anybody else. So. <laughs> Okay. Okay, Jean Rosenberg uh, asked another question. Do you urge other Cuban Americans to visit Cuba? Well, I mean, every person has to make their own decision. My sister never went back. She never wanted to go back. For me, being back put me in touch with myself in many ways. Made me remember things even in a way understand things that you know as a child or adolescent, but you don't fully understand until you're on the ground, so to speak. And and sort of, it, it did, okay. It did something very important for me to be back there and remember myself there. And, and learn new things about being there. As I said, many pieces about Cuban politics fell into place better in a way, or about events in my parents' lives, for example, fell into place in a much better way after having been back than just being away and thinking that everything is what I remember rather than being on the ground. Hey, here's a question from Books and Books. Uh, uh -huh. How long did you work on the book? And did you do a lot of research and read any other memoirs that were influential? I Yes, I read many memoirs and many other things in preparation. It took me about 10 years. And I was in the writer's group from the beginning because, okay, I have nine books that are academic books, including the book on the saints. It's, it's an academic study of certain people. Um, this book is completely different. The style of writing is completely different. It's not, it's not how I knew how to write. So I was in a writer's group and the women in my writer's group who I thank profusely in the acknowledgement sort of said, clarify there were things okay there were things i took for granted and they said what is this so i had to explain things that were obvious for me that i sort of assume i know what this is i also had to say it not in a way that was an academic speech but in a way that was a personal account so i had to sort of transform my way of writing and there were many versions of this book and many things that ended up being left out of the final product because 
you know, they did not fit there, or were too stiff, or whatever it may have been. So yeah, it took me about 10 years to do the book. Okay, here's another question coming up. Mm -hmm. How was the insurrection from 1956 to 58 present into your adolescence? Jean Rosenberg again. Okay. I went to Santiago a couple of times then. And of course it was very close. I actually, okay, even before, I was in Santiago in 1953, a month after the assault to the Moncada. But 26 July when Fidel attacked the Moncada barricades and etc. And I was there a month after. And all the conversation was about, you know, people grumbling, people whispering about the cruelty of the police and this and that and the other, a number of things of that sort. And um, so whenever I went to Santiago during that time, of course, that was very much part of the conversation. And my aunts and uncles were very involved in being you know, against Batista and against anything that had to do with that. Particularly, one of my uncles stayed very much with the revolution, which is why my cousins are still there. And um, so that that was present. It was less obvious in Havana, but still it was. You could not go at night out because we, we knew that people were being killed and you know bodies appeared in the street and in fact there was a boy i went boy well a young man <laughs> I, I i went out with maybe twice not not it was not any anything important but i knew him and i knew several others that they were all killed by the batista police so you you knew that you were in constant danger and actually, one of the things, I don't even know if that's in the book or not. I went to Spain when I won that prize. I went to Spain in 58 in that summer. And one of the things that impressed me was that you could be in a theater without being afraid that the bomb was going to go off. Because we were constantly afraid that something was going to happen. So that, you know, that was there. Uh, even not to the degree that people were involved with it, at least in my close circle. But so yes, absolutely. I mean, there was no way. When I, in the in the section of the book about 1958, I talk a lot about that, about what was going on, and you know all the cruelty and and how el ton el tunnel the tunnel was in a way an excuse to distract people from the fact that people were being killed. Etc. So yes. Raquel Matas uh, asks whether uh, you have considered writing the memoir in Spanish. <sighs> no. <laughs> it's you know I may have to get a translator. Actually, it's it would be too much work. To doing your own translation is very difficult. I mean, I, you have to sort of have to have a mindset and write in one language. And um, it, it's no, I'm, I, I would I would love to have a translator and have it translated into Spanish. And, you know, so. Perhaps the fact that you wrote it in English give, gives you a little distance no? from, I from suppose, the events. I suppose. And also because I was writing in a context of this group of women writers, there are things I talk about in English that would not have been necessary if the book were written in Spanish for Latin Americans. I would have probably included songs, and I include some songs and some poems from the time, but I would have included many more songs and many more poems because that was all around me when I was growing up. And it didn't make any sense to put them in the English version because most people did not have any connection with those poems or those songs. 
And yet you mentioned in your presentation that phrase, pum pum cayo Berlin, which I had uh -huh. never heard. Oh, but. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> there are things that are unavoidable in Spanish. Pim pim cayo Berlin, pom pom cayo Japón. Okay. And I know if you noticed when I was saying the adventures of Tarzan, I said Tarzan, which is what. Okay. So. Spanish, yes. Yeah. Okay, here's a question from my colleague, Aime Correa, and uh, she uh, might be articulating the same question that other people have in mind, which is, uh, did you have any, do you have any blood relationship with Bill Maspin? Yeah, well, yes, uh, she's a, she is, was actually a distant cousin, but I never met her, you know. If my name was Rodriguez, no one would make the association, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, we are distant cousins, but I never met her. I never, she's, she's, she was older than me, considerably, about 10 years older than me. But I, you know, I never knew that she existed. Like I probably, the bunch of other relatives that I don't even know exist. Um, so I, I found out she existed and that we were somewhat related when she became famous, not before. So, yeah. But that's a what's, question lots of people. What's ask. your mother's last name? I was curious about the Spanish side of the family. Del Prado. Del Prado. And they also were located in the in the Oriente region. In Santiago, yes. Santiago. Yeah. Yeah. In Santiago. Okay, I see one more question here. We're running out of time, but uh, let me see what that is. Oh, okay. Well, another question for my good colleague Jean Rosenberg. How did your life change with the triumph of the revolution? Ay. <laughs> A big question, no? Yeah. I mean, well, the, maybe the best way to explain it is I was beginning, I was tutoring children, as I said, since I finished high school. I was teaching in a girls' school. And after the Bay of Pigs invasion, um, you know, all you, you, you all know that, all the schools were nationalized. So all the teachers in all schools that summer of 1961 had to go to a special training to learn how to teach, which meant to learn how to teach socialism, although they were not saying it that way at that time. And I thought, you know, I cannot, I was teaching adolescent girls that were 13, 14, I am not going to teach what I don't believe in to young girls. I mean, that's not, if I had been working as a secretary, if I had been working in some sort of position in which I was doing other things, I probably would have stayed longer. But I wasn't going to be teaching children or young people things that I thought were wrong. So that's what, so that's it i mean divided my life in two at that moment so that that's probably the most obvious um way in which my life changed yes one, fi one final question happened, yep. a lot of what happened right before then is that i was having these panic attacks after my uncle's death so i really could not think much you know, I was trying to, to survive within my own terrors. So I I didn't do much before then. But then when the moment came of you have to do this, I thought, no, I'm not going to do it. So, okay. Yeah, let me ask you one final question. Um, uh, you may have heard of the concept of 1.5 generation. No. Have you used? No, you haven't used that. No. Well, it's just a simple idea that the first generation of people like yourself who were born and raised in one country. Then there's a second generation born and raised in another country. But then there are people in between, like right. myself. I left right. when I was three years old. And uh -huh. so I wonder if psychologically speaking, there may be any differences between people based on the age they left Cuba. I do think so. And I think one of the main have to do with memory, which was your first question. I mean, as I said, I remember Cuba. I left at 22. I was an adult, young and inexperienced and et cetera, but I have clear memories of the place. I am sure you don't have clear memories of the place. 
So it starts with that. In fact, my youngest brother, who left when he was 10 years old, was always asking me questions. He would have been 71 two days ago. And he, he kept asking me questions. And what about this? And what about that? And what about the other? Because he didn't know. So I think the main thing is that. And so there, and concretely, when we were in 2017, we had these two young tour guides who said things that were completely, I don't know. And people ask, for example, who built the Capitol building? And this young woman says, the United States. <laughs> and I said, what? It was Gerardo Machado in this year and for this reason. And, you know, so there's, there's a way in which younger people, I mean, you know what you're told, right? Or what you see. If you haven't seen it, you repeat what you were told. You don't, you don't have your own memory to know what happened that you studied in school when other things were being told to you. And so anyway. Yeah. So one final, final question uh, from Lourdes Fernandez. How do you remember your life in Costa Rica? Was it different or similar to Cuba? There were things that were similar in that we were speaking the same language, although with a very different accent. And in fact, my Spanish still has some tinges of Costa Rican something that make it a little weird. Although when I went back to Cuba, I love to hear Cuban accent, but okay. So there were things that were very similar. There were other things that were different. Um, you know, the folk music, the places, etc. I love Costa Rica. I mean, half of my heart is still there. And I have very dear friends who were my students when I was 25 years old and they were 15. But now, of course, they're in their 70s while well, I'm in my 80s. So, you know, um, so we are still, it's still very close to my heart. And, and it's a beautiful place. And I love what they have done with health issues. How they do public health there is extraordinary because it's a very poor country and yet they do an excellent job of that. The conservation of natural resources, how they manage to get tourists to look at it and in doing that, they preserve them, etc. So there are lots of things about Costa Rica that I absolutely love. And some things are very different and and i'm still you know i'm there's a difference yes okay so our time is up thank you oliva for sharing your thoughts and your work with the audience uh, and let me remind you again before closing that you can purchase a copy of your book my native land is memory by calling the number uh, on your screen at books and books and they'll be happy to send you a copy Thank you again. This concludes our event and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. And feel free to uh, write to me if you have any other questions personally. Okay. <laughs>